It is indeed a good job, and I appreciate that you had the opportunity to read the words of Scripture. If you had not read that piece before, now you have. And your mouth has said them, and your mind has thought about them, and I'm hoping that you can picture in your mind this group that has just been rescued from the, the, the clutches of the Egyptian Empire. Now, in times past, I've, I've shown a bit of the most recent movie that is out there concerning the Exodus, and I think that it does a good job of giving you the idea of the immensity of what went on. But from that moment on, they move into the desert, and there they are in front of Mount Sinai. Please know, please know that, that this was an incredible, incredible moment of people who had been in slavery for 430 years. So they had not been in church. They had not been in a regular relationship with God. They had been in slavery. And so please, in what we talk about today, just understand that this is the context in which we think about being called a holy nation. God is arbitrarily choosing a people. There is no reason except that he is now honoring the promise that he made to their forefathers. So if you know your history and maybe a promise that God made to your grandfather, you know what I'm talking about. But you see, God comes first to Abraham's father, Terah, and then to Abraham himself and says, I will make you into a great nation. Jesus later on says, Paul later on says, that the world is blessed by the people of God. Why are they saying this? They're saying this because God said it. He said, I choose you. I choose you. If you choose me and want to be part of my people, then that's what's going to happen. You will be a blessing to the whole world. You've heard me say before that uh, I believe that uh, my new name uh, for Jesus is The Plan. If you, if, if you think about it, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Christ, was the plan that God used to save and is using, thank you, is using to save the world. In that plan, he said that there would be a family, there would be a people, and so that people were the ones that were chosen as Abraham's seed. Now, it's good news today, and I'm, I'm kind of jumping back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament, because we're New Testament people, right? We're past the Old Testament. We look back on the Old Testament. We're New Testament people, and we're very glad, I'm very glad, that I can be, I can be called a seed of Abraham. Because that means that the promise that was made to Abraham is also made to me, and the way that that happens is if I decide that I am going to be part of the holy nation, which Jesus has said now, includes the whole world of those individuals who say yes. Those individuals who want to be, as it were, on God's team. I, I use the word team because, you know, we... We're about to get back into football season, and there are those who, who are even going to get together in, in, on the premises here and, 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 and choose which people they're going to have on their fantasy football team. Now, some of you are laughing because fantasy football is reality. I mean, you pay attention. You pay attention. So I want to say to you this morning, in the end, now we're talking about the Super Bowl, the big thing, the thing that happens at the end. In the end, God wins. You remember nothing else about being here today and about what I say to you in these next few moments. Please remember that phrase. In the end, 
God wins. Turn in your Bibles if you want or on your phones. Go to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to be working out of there today just to give you a quick idea. It's going to be kind of a a theme for the, 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 this particular time is going to be a sports theme. So please, please don't worry if there's a few analogies that go like that because I'm talking in that vein today. But Revelation chapter one starts like this. I am the alpha and the omega. This is verse eight. He who is, he who was and he who is to come. That is the name that God gives himself. So if you want to know which God you worship, if you want to know uh, uh, how it is that that we can claim such audacious things about our God, he is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. We know him as the Almighty. See, because God, as I've just been explaining, God has and is putting together a winning team. That's what he's doing. They may have uh, uh, some home field disadvantage. I mean, we are living in the valley of the shadow of death, right? So God's team, the valley, you could say the team of life, has a disadvantage. They may not have the the home field advantage, but the coach, our coach, knows every single move that the opposition, that the, the opposite team is going to make. And it's not because he's cheating. He just knows, you see, because he was, he is, and he's already in the future. I know that may just scramble your brains for a moment. But he has already seen the future. He has already been in the future. That's what our God claims. So he knows the moves that the opposite team is going to make before they make them. He knew that the eclipse was coming. He knew that the hurricane was coming. Even before it came up on our radar, he knew. That's why in the end, I believe that God Almighty wins. Revelation 1 spells out his plan and gives us an idea of who gets to play on his team. I don't know if it's building within you, but it certainly is building within me the desire to be known as somebody who is on God's team. Revelation 1.1, first things first. The game plan comes from Jesus Christ. If you've never read Revelation before and you might want to just see it as God's game plan for the future, then please understand that this book is not about some weird animal kingdom that you might find out is in Revelation. It's about Jesus Christ and he's trying to describe maybe in some coded language what is going to come, what is going to happen, what the plays will be. As he is revealed, so his team will know who they are, what part they play, and how they will win. So just understand, this is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is our coach, and as we get to know him better, we will know our part in the game. Jesus sends an angel messenger to John on Patmos. John will be shown the game plan and, get this, who's on the team roster? Okay, everybody wants to know when the roster comes out, am I on the team? Did I make the cut? Well, John's going to tell us. John says that this revelation is true and anyone who hears it and reads it and takes it to heart will be blessed by God. So right there he tells you your chances are good. If you hear God's call and you take his call to heart to be on his team and you understand him as the one who was, who is, and who is to come, and that that's who our coach, manager, and owner of the team is, then you might just want to be on the roster. 
John addresses the letter to the seven churches in Asia, Asia Minor. I, I often am interested in these directions because the, the fact is I, I still wonder what was going on in India and China at this time. But he says to the seven churches in Asia, and you know those churches because you see them in Revelation chapter 3, and you know these are churches in Turkey mostly today, not in what we would consider the Far East. Salutations, he says, salutations from the one who was, who is, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits, the angels that are before the throne who represent these churches. Salutations from Jesus Christ, the Messiah. By the way, that's what Christ means. Just remember there's sort of Greek and Hebrew. Messiah is Hebrew. Christ is Greek. So when we think of Jesus Christ, we're basically saying Jesus the Messiah, the one who was to come, the one who Mary was told would be her son and who Eve was also told would come. Long time later, Mary had that baby. Amazing how long we had to wait for that, but he did come. Salutations from this one, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, who is the faithful witness, get this, the firstborn of the dead. Movies made with similar names. Okay? I'd like to see this movie. I think there'd be movies made about Jesus' resurrection. We don't exactly know what that looked like. We do know that it happened, and we do know that he met with people. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He made it through, my friends, and when we think about that, we realize that he promised that if I make it through, if I win... You will win too. I don't know about you, but that's, I think that is the essence of the good news. As I talk to friends, both in this area and in other areas in my life, and they're having problems, and there are people who are dying of old age or of disease or whatever, they need good news. They need to know this is not the end, this is not it, this is an interruption. That's what death is. It's an interruption in our eternal life. That's good news. Jesus, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Something I hope that, that we also can grab a hold of is that when Jesus raised from the dead, he won. The controversy that had been going on between him and Satan was over at that point. As far as he and Satan were concerned, Jesus had won. Please understand that. The difference between the cross and the second coming is, is this waiting period that we are caught in that theologians call the already and the not yet. Yeah, that's why Adventists exist. Because we're telling people, there's an already. Jesus has already won. He, he, he beat Satan at Golgotha. He did exactly what the prophecy said. He stuck a stake in the head of the snake. Yeah, that's what the cross was. Prophecy said, the snake will bruise your heel, but you will crush the serpent's head. That's what the prophecy said, right? To Eve? Jesus did that. And so we look forward now in anticipation of the coming, the fulfillment, the inauguration that's going to take place when Jesus comes with all of us on his team in his train. I don't want to get caught up in this because you can tell that it really, really gets me going. The fact is, he won! Amen. And because he won, we can too. He's the king of this earth. Let's never forget that. Satan is a pretender. He just wants you to know, if you follow him, that things will be all cool in that. But he's, he's nothing but a spoiler, folks. He knows where he's going. We just read that. He knows that his time is short. 
We know he knows that. And, and all he wants to do is ruin your life like, he's, like his life has been ruined because of the choices that he has made. Please remember that. God, in the end, what? God wins. And we can also say, in the, at the cross, Jesus has already won. And now he's made a way for us to win too. Now we know the coach, the staff, the management. We know who's sending us an invite to be on the team, according to Revelation chapter 1. So how does he do this? How does, how does, how does, he, how does he invite us onto the team? Verse 5, to him who loves us. Don't you love that? It's present continuous. Present continuous. I don't care what you did last week. God still loves you. Amen. There were some people this last week, I'm sure, who did some things to some other people. I'm being very general here because I don't know anything in specific. I'm not thinking of anything in specific. But there were some people who did some mean things to other people this week. You know what? God still loves those mean people. He still would love it if they would re realize that they are being mean and that they would stop and that they would join his team. I mean, let's take Paul, for example. He was going to Damascus. He was going to reel in those Christians, bring them back for trial, possible death. And God came and said, no, Paul. Well, Saul, I don't want you doing that. I want you to be on my team. How about it? Do you know that it took Paul three and a half years to fix his hard drive? But when he came out of the desert, when he came to Jerusalem and Barnabas brought him to the rest of the disciples, he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God, through Jesus Christ, had saved him. It was so important to him, he changed his name from Saul to Paul. Some of us might want to think about changing our names too. <laughs> we realized this morning on Facebook that my daughter has now changed her name. She is now Michaela Stevenson Johnson. You make a decision to be associated. You change your name. Read Revelation 3. You'll see that there's a name change that happens there too. Verse 5, to him who loves us, present continuous, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. My friends, we just need to know that he paid the price to liberate us from having to play, the, uh, uh, having to play on the opposite side. Just let that sink in. That was the whole purpose of Jesus' coming, was to give us the opportunity to make a choice, a real choice, not to be forced into slavery, into believing the lies. No, we don't ever like to be forced. He came to give us a, a real choice. Do you want this or do you want this? Team counsel, the legal counsel, tried hard to keep this offer from going through. In this negotiation, Jesus sweat blood. If you don't believe that in Gethsemane there was huge negotiation going on, then you need to read that again. Because that's why Jesus was straining so hard that the capillaries in his forehead broke he was straining to not give in to the temptations that the evil one was hurling at him at that time. And I certainly believe, this preacher believes, it was to leave us and go back to his father without going through with the death on the cross. He was making a way for us to be on his team. He was paying the price. He was negotiating with the evil one himself. The Bible says that angels had to be dispatched to help uh, uh, keep him from...
from dying. He did this so that we could be free agents. So that we would not be forced by any contract from our previous past to make a, a, a particular decision or to be forced to be on a particular team. We don't have to be. We now have the opportunity through what Jesus has done to choose for ourselves. He would pay the price with his blood. It was freely given and for all it was the freedom to choose. In verse 6 he announces the team name. Priests. Now someone to say that that's not gender inclusive but I'm just going to say for our purposes today it is. The team name is going to be the priests and they will serve the God and Father, the coach, the owner, the manager. They will be a team and they will win because, say it with me, in the end, God wins. In the end, God wins. So the priests and kings, which we read this in the, the Exodus text, the priests and kings, this holy nation, See, because verse 7 is a preview of the ultimate showdown. The, the Almighty and his entourage will make their entrance on the clouds. I, I don't know, you can see a lot of college football and, and, and they have these pieces of paper and you have the mascot just bursting through and you have fireworks and, you know, it's a lot of fun to watch. But look how many people uh, traveled thousands of miles, thank you, Cardis, uh, to, to see an eclipse. Paula says it was the most amazing thing she'd ever seen in her entire life. All two minutes of it. Two minutes, 38 seconds. There you go. People from Australia came to our country. People from all over came to this country because this is where the, the, the best viewing of, of this eclipse would happen. And yes, it did, here in Santa Clarita, it did get a little gloomy and strange looking for a while. Uh, we decided to watch it on TV rather than risking going out and, you know, or buying one of those crazy contraptions that people look at the sun with. Uh, although some of us uh, were very ingenious and made special lenses for our cameras so that our cameras could take pictures. Very cool. Every eye will see this spectacle. Even those, it's Ellen White who tells us about a special resurrection, even those who pierced him, i.e., the opposing team. When, when Jesus and his team make their entrance into the arena for the final, final showdown, it will be on the clouds of heaven and every eye will see. Now we've tried in the various stadiums around this country to make sure that it, there's not a bad seat in the house. You can sit anywhere in these stadiums and you can see huge big screens and, 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 and nobody misses a thing because it's all on the screen. Well, God's going to figure out that every eye will see his team making their entrance into the amphitheater. Amid shouts of victory from the, the priests, the team that he comes with, there will be booing and moaning from the opposing team. Booing because they hate them, moaning because they wish they were them. Yes, yes, all this happens, and even in fantasy football. Oh man, I wish I had that guy on my team. I'd be doing so much better. Moan, 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 moan. They know that they are lost and that they have lost. They, they had their chance to be on the priest's team, to be part of the holy nation. But they chose an earthbound team. They chose the opposition. And in that, in that face-off, God Almighty announces himself 
again to all of these people, every person on planet Earth, he announces himself as what? The one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess. Yep, they take a knee. Just like our modern day gladiators, they, they take a knee, everybody does. But this time it is to the coach, the manager, and the owner of the team called the priests. It was always me, he says. It was always me. It, it, it's me now, it was me, and it will always be me. I am Almighty God and Father, creator of the universe, owner, manager, coach of the priests and kings team. Remember, in the end, I'm going to win. So if you can imagine even this tiny smidgen of what John has just told us, maybe because of the fact that you saw the eclipse or the Super Bowl, then you can imagine the agony, the agony of being on the team that comes against the priests. But today we all have another chance. I think like, like every day when we wake up, I, I walked past some of my friends in my neighborhood and uh, I greeted them and, and I said, it, it's a great day. And she said, yes, it's a great day to be above ground. Yeah. So a recognition that, that if you're above ground, if you're in the hearing of my voice today, it's a great day. And it's a day when you also have that choice. Because when you go below ground, your time of choosing is done. Today we can choose to be on God's team. Today we can choose to be part of the priests and kings team. Today we can choose to be part of the holy nation. We can say yes to the Father. We can say yes to the coaching Holy Spirit. We can say yes to following His playbook. We can, we, we, we can, we can live life here in the valley of the shadow of death and be on His team. So let us pray a prayer of supplication today, a prayer of acceptance, a prayer of willing obedience, a prayer for a place on God's team. Now today we, we already had prayer for our leaders who you saw the posting of those leaders last week, I just want to say that as pastor, I'm thankful that there are people who have said yes to leading out in the various functions of this congregation. I'm thankful because that's what we need. I, I want you to know it's not for my glory though. Uh, maybe I've had enough time in ministry to know that this is not about me. Those of you who said yes, you said yes to God. And you said yes to a function in a particular organization. But I want to extend that to everyone that's listening to me right now. God is asking all of us to be on his team. And he's asking all of us to, to give him the opportunity to lead and guide us in our work, in our play, in our families, in our extended society, and through us, he will do his will in other people's lives. Now, I just want you to know that I, I am not one of those individuals who believes that if we don't do it, God's not going to be able to do it. See, because my Bible shows me that God always wins. It also shows me that it didn't necessarily take his people to do it. So why be on God's team? I'll tell you why. Because you get to stand next to God while he is winning. And you know what that makes you? A winner! Chicken dinner! 
So if you want to be a winner today, stand next to God. Amen.